How do you expect culture to change as Bitcoin becomes more widely adopted? Fantastic question. How do I accept, expect culture to change? There is this fantastic video clip from the late uh, 80s, early 90s of Good Morning America, or one of these silly TV shows. And you've got all of these people sitting on a couch around there, and they're preparing to film a segment where they're going to explain the internet to other people. Um, but they're running into one small problem, which is they have no freaking clue what it is. And uh, this is the outtakes where you can see them discussing it, and it is absolutely hilarious. They are very famous uh, American TV personalities, who I don't personally know. Uh, and they're, they're going, so wait, so the internet is the at thing. <laughs> and, and the other person is, no, 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 that's email. <laughs> I think. No, I think the internet is the www thing. Does that have an at? No, no, it's just www and then dot http. I don't know. It's something like that. And so the culture is struggling. Um, okay, no, I just called an American morning TV show culture, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of the culture was also struggling. And Two things happen. This is a process of convergence. One part of convergence is that the technology gets a hundred times easier to use. And the other part of convergence is that the culture gradually adapts. The people who are already of a mature age, let's say, uh, have to learn some new words and get very confused. And that's, that's one of the bad things about aging. Change isn't fun. And then there's a whole generation of people who are born into it, and they don't know any different. Um, I love watching my niece interact with Windows. Not Windows 10, Windows in the house. <laughs> because when she sees glass, she goes... <laughs> and tries to interact with it, because all of the glass in her life is responsive, and always has been. So she assumes this is a property of glass, not devices. <laughs> if the glass looks even slightly black, she taps it. But this is really a keen insight into the culture because what's happening is she is now living in a world where glass always responded. And here's the interesting thing. As of 2009, a whole generation of kids have been born for whom internet money always existed. And it will be normal. In fact, the best part is one day it will be boring. And that's when we know it's really mainstream. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So I just want to say welcome to Colorado. And really, I hope that I can impress upon you how much we want you here as a community. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm part of this growing movement here, I think. There's so many that I recognize. Um, specifically, we're, we're here to shield Colorado, but also these technologies and these social movements that you're so much about. Um, so, I guess what I'm asking is, um, please make us a regular stop on your journeys. We'd love to have you back. Yes. And um, we believe, I think, in uh, education, evangelism, and advocacy for all these things. And like you pointed out, we don't need it yet, but moving forward, we we probably will. So, what, in your opinion, is the best, most effective ways to promote, inform, and inspire adoption of these things here and then globally? So I think one of the most important things is not to try to sell this technology to people who don't need it, and to be humble about it. Um, I know that we all have this excitement, right? I felt it myself, which is, we've discovered this little secret. And most people don't know about it yet, and we want to tell everyone. And this happens to me regularly in my life, and nobody listens. Um, and well, okay, a few more people listening this time, but <laughs> several previous times didn't go so well. Um, in that enthusiasm, one of the things that happens is we risk coming across as being pushy, especially when we're excited about things like the price. Because then, and people are motivated by greed. Like anybody who tells you they're not motivated by greed is either an alien or lying, or not aware of their own motivations. But we are all motivated by greed. It's okay to recognize that when the value of these currencies rises and we've made an investment, 
it's nice. I mean, it feels good. First of all, you feel personally vindicated. It's like, ah, oh, show these people who doubted me. They said it was a pyramid scheme, but now I'm making money. Well, guess what? Pyramid schemes make money. <laughs> so if you think that's the answer, it's not a pyramid scheme. I'm making tons of money. That sounds exactly like every pyramid <laughs> scheme. <laughs> but at some point, many of us have this moment where we got in because we were excited or we heard about it and maybe we got very excited about the price but the price doesn't last right eventually you get a downturn most people leave and some people stay and some people who stay read something and learn something and realize that there's more to this than just an investment they realize that there's something else going on here something that's meaningful and deep and important and at that point if you can convey that enthusiasm without being the crazy person at the party, to the people who really are interested in hearing about it. And there's plenty of people who are and who need this. And if they don't, they don't. That's okay too. At the end of the day, the most important thing is basic education. And to me, one of the most important parts of basic education is teaching people how not to get scammed, robbed, or losing their money. So, teach them about scams, right? How to be critical about all of these things that are bubbling up in our space. Don't go day trading suddenly because you discovered, oh, there's not just one currency, there's 1200 on coincap.io and I think some of those are going to boom any second now and I'm going to go invest in these penny stocks. Bad move, right? Protect your friends from doing that, going crazy speculation. Protect your friends from falling for pyramid schemes. There are a lot of pyramid schemes and Ponzi schemes in this space. Just in the last two years, we had BitConnect and OneCoin. Those have been wound up, but the next one is just round the corner. Right? Um, there are a lot of unscrupulous actors because you have a combination of money and technology, and it's promising. Educate people how not to lose their coins. Warn them about putting money permanently on exchanges or other custodial wallets in which they do not control their keys. And explain to them why that means they do not actually own any coins. Teach them how to do backups and make sure they actually do backups. Teach them how to make a plan for inheritance because things happen and maybe you want to give that gift to your family. Teach them about how to use this technology to change their own life. And that doesn't mean becoming millionaires, but it might mean becoming an expert or a teacher or a user of this technology sooner than everybody else. And so if you focus on these core education things and you avoid the temptation of all of the drama and tribalism and fear of missing out and greed, then these people will stay through each one of the cycles, and we can start building more and more community. And that works, I know, because I've seen it work for the past five years. Thank you so much. Way cool talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want you uh, maybe to talk a little bit about what you think would be positive steps moving forward into the future. Like, how would we know that Bitcoin is succeeding? And then flip side if there are some things that we might see in the future that should make us concerned. Um, yes. Okay. So I did a talk about this topic specifically uh, in Dublin a few months ago. It's called um, Measuring Success. Uh, and it's about how you really measure success in a technology like this. And to me, measuring success is about whether we can deliver the fundamental principles that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies give us to as many people as possible without diluting those principles. So, if we are able to get a decentralized, open, borderless, neutral, censorship-resistant currency payment system, smart contract system, or whatever else, to as many people as possible, we win. If instead what we give as many people as possible is a 
distorted version of that that is controlled by a few companies with heavy controls on who can use it and when they can use it, centralized access points, white lists and black lists, and um, criminal protection and safety measures added on to ensure that effectively it's Facebook coin or Fed coin or Google coin or some other perversion of this idea. That's not success. That's recreating business as usual. We already have PayPal. We already have Visa. We don't need more of that. We need something different. So success is maintaining the principles for, and giving the choice to as many people as possible to adopt those principles if they need them in their life. Right? So a system that works for lots of people and preserves those principles. And what are the bad signs? The bad signs are when you start seeing, and you see that all the time, in fact, interested companies and interested individuals and interested governments coming and saying, for your safety, we have to make a few minor changes. We have to make sure that criminals can't use this. We have to make sure that we can control who uses this technology. We have to make the technology safer for your own good. And what do you say? Hell no. Fuck off, Bitcoin's fine. <laughs> but they will do that in every country in the world. And we already have safe money. And the only criminals who can use that are the ones who already have a banking license. And we want to go away from that. Trisha asks, where and what is the best way for me to help others to get started in Bitcoin? As a newbie myself, many people ask me questions about getting started in Bitcoin. I generally say, get on an exchange first, and once approved, then let's talk. Not sure if that is where to send them, and if so, where is the best next step to send them to? What exchange would you recommend, and how much to get started? Any other tips to help me help others would be great. Um, you know, quite honestly, I don't think that buying cryptocurrency should be the first step. Um, I think looking to buy cryptocurrency really puts you immediately in the mind that this is something that you invest in and hold as an asset rather than a currency that you use uh, and that is useful to you. And in fact, if you do go and buy this cryptocurrency as an exchange, first of all, you are going to end up hitting all of the barriers of the traditional uh, banking system. You are going to have to do wire transfers. You are going to have to do identity verification. It is going to take days to confirm. And then your accounts can be frozen and, and blocked, and you might have problems doing transfers because of the banking regulations. So your first experience in cryptocurrency shouldn't be a healthy dose of banking experience. That, that sh that's not cryptocurrency. Uh, and exchanges are really um, uh, not necessarily the best way to start experiencing cryptocurrency. So first of all, I don't think persuading people to use cryptocurrency who don't need cryptocurrency is necessarily a good idea. Um, again, that's an investment mentality, which is adoption for the sake of adoption. Whereas um, I think it's more important to, to try to understand why someone might need cryptocurrency in their life. So, For example, if they are sending money to a, a relative in another country, there you have a great use case. Uh, and so, if you meet someone who's sending money to another country and they're currently using Western Union and is charging them thirty-five dollars per transaction or some outrageous amount like that, and a healthy uh, exchange rate spread, maybe they have a use for cryptocurrency. And so, in that case, what you could tell them about is how to use a, a Bitcoin ATM um, or <clears throat> how to use a service like Local Bitcoins to exchange currency for. Uh, to exchange fiat for cryptocurrency, and then how to set up a smartphone wallet. I think probably the best advice I give to people and get them into Bitcoin is I help them set up a smartphone wallet, preferably one that I have experience with and that I like using, um, and that's easy to use. Uh, and so try to figure out which smartphone wallet works best for you. 
uh, or you think will work best for newbies. One that is not a custodial wallet, but one that actually gives you control of your own keys. And I would help them set up a smartphone wallet. I also give a small donation of Bitcoin, um, you know, just to get people started so they can experience a transaction and see how it works. Um, and then from that point on, you could teach them how to find a Bitcoin ATM uh, or uh, get some uh, Bitcoin by exchanging fiat through local Bitcoins or another peer-to-peer -peer trade, or encourage them to meet other people who are into cryptocurrency who might be willing to sell them a small amount of cryptocurrency for cash. Um, and then try to describe situations where you use cryptocurrency and not just invest it in it. Thank you.